Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. I am finally out in my backyard for the year. It's uh, it's kind of a breezy morning this morning. I really hope the wind doesn't goof up the sound on this. I'll see, I'm trying to situate it in this hilly area where I'm at that uh, the wind won't cross blow across the microphone. Let's do some more Bobby Fisher chess videos, shall we? There is some great stuff coming up with Bobby Fischer's uh, games, and we're going to start watching them right now. He, this is going to be him playing the Sicilian defenses black. He played that a lot, and he got quite adept at the Sicilian. So this is kind of fun to see, night F3. Boy, it's a beautiful sunny morning. It's only 43 degrees. It's cool, and this breeze is kind of blowing around, so I'm gonna talk extra loud on purpose. I'm not trying to yell at you. I just want you to hear it, uh, hear the information. So D6 and D4, what a beautiful place to be to play chess. Share chess with you, my online viewers. And I'm loving playing chess with you guys online. I'm actually noticing a little bit of improvement in my game. Uh, and that's got me excited. Several of you who've been beating the socks off me are still beating the socks off me. But I'm beginning to win a little bit too. So that's encouraging. That's fun. Uh, that's just the way it works. In chess, the more you play, the better you get. The idea is, let's all get up there to uh, Grandmaster level in, by next week. <laughs> Yeah, whatever! Dream on, cowboy! Okay, he takes the D-pawn, and the knight takes. Now, this is one typical variation in the uh, Sicilian, there's no question about it. And Fisher, of course, is going to fight for the center. He always fought for the center, even in his wonderful 13-year-old youth. We're still in 1956. Uh, we aren't going to get out of 1956 for a little while because Fisher began playing tournaments seriously. He went, he, I mean, he even went up into Canada. Uh, he was going to New York and then down over into Arkansas or Texas. And then he went up north into Canada and he kept playing tournaments. I've got some great games from Canada that he played. That really is fun. Night F6, quit talking and show the game, dude. Oh, that sunshine feels good. Wonderful. I'll show you some video of the surrounding area. And then I got a beautiful sunset the other night. I'll show that at the end of the video. That way, those of you who want to watch the chess, get to watch the chess. Those of you who also want to see nature, can also see nature. That way, I don't make anybody mad. And yet, in a way, I make everybody mad. Oh, here comes my neighbor. Drive on by, dude. All right, people drive by here all the time. So they, they rudely interrupt my video making. Oh, it's disgustifying. Yes, I'm kidding. Okay, now, uh, Bishop E2, they're gonna develop pretty good. And th this is just classic Fisher. I mean, it's classic Grandmaster chess. I, I say Fisher because I'm showing Fisher games, right? You bump a pawn to six either the D or the E, and then you push the second central pawn forward to challenge the center. Uh, you will see this in the majority of Grandmaster games. This is kind of the principle, as a general rule, we can adopt, more or less. And again, you have to learn how to read the position to know which pawn to put on six and which on five, right? In this instance, he's going to hit the knight because the knight has such great central influence, but also because it is a great central post and he doesn't want that knight to stay there. That makes sense, truly. So he bumps his knight back to f3. And now bishop e7, they are developing along. They will both castle, absolutely. Castling is probably 
one of the most important moves you can do in, early in your game if you can at all help it. Try very hard, never leave your king in the center of the board if you can at all help it. Now the knight will bump to here. Now the idea, he is supporting his e5 and this square by putting the knight here, yes? That makes sense. So he's solidifying his center at this point. This knight will support this square and hit this square in case Fisher needs to push the pawn. He has that square covered. Does that make sense? Okay. Had he come to here, notice the different squares the knight will influence. This one and this one, if he comes to here. These two. Coming to here, he influences these two and these two. So there, there's a difference in an opening from putting your knight on the six or the six as opposed to the seven. I, I know a lot of us know that, but a lot of us don't. I have a lot of beginner people who are asking me questions as I'm playing in chess, and so that's one reason. This opening is fundamentally different in character. It will change uh, the way you move your knights, your pawns, and your bishops, and where you'll put your queen here as opposed to there. It's just something to keep in mind, that's all, right? So Fisher is going here, he's going to support these two squares and these two squares here at this point. I'm just showing. Okay, rook e1, yeah. This is typical in a Sicilian. Eventually, there will be open files coming on in the center. Fisher begins a, a side uh, advance, gaining more space, not necessarily an attack until just now. So he's pushing his B pawn hard. Look at the effect this has. You know, we've heard it said, and I have said it myself, not too many pawn moves in the opening until you get all your pieces developed. And yet here we see the great Bobby Fisher running a pawn all the way up there, making a lot of pawn moves. But look how it will affect the character of the center of the board with that pawn push. Just observe this. It's worth looking at. Knight comes to d5. Nice outpost in the center. It's not a permanent one. No, of course not. But notice how his pawn push has changed which squares in the center that he's going to fight for. That's interesting. That's just worth just something to keep in mind. We don't have to do a detailed analysis just yet, but here's why it changed the character. Oh, here comes that breeze. I hope this doesn't give the mic up. The knight will now take the knight, and now we're getting an exchange of knights, which changes the power of who owns what in the center. I'm just saying that to show you, uh, to observe this. And then the queen will take. So now there's been an exchange of knights, this knight on this side, and this knight on this side. The queen's coming in. She will affect different squares across, up and down, diagonal. She will affect different squares than those knights were affecting. I'm just, just as an observation, this is why it helps us understand why they open and why they play the way they play in the opening. Fisher is also going to keep developing. Now that the queen is out, and you say, well, the queen's out a little early, but there's been a couple of exchanges. There's been several moves. Yes, they aren't fully developed yet, but Fisher goes ahead and brings his queen out because his opponent has his queen out. Notice the pawn is gone here, and the pawn is past this square. So the queen is not going to be threatened by pawns at this point. Right? So that's a pretty good centralized queen. Of course, she's not going to be able to stay there just yet. But what's the dynamics of the reaction? Now she comes back to here to control that B pawn. Kind of an interesting move there, right? However, you ask, wait a minute, dude. Why didn't she just take the rook? Ah, 
That's because the knight move traps the queen. And white would have lost the queen. So he, he calculated that out and saw there's nowhere safe for the queen to go now. So that's why the queen did not take the rook. The rook is a poisoned rook. Unavailable at this point. So let's, let's keep control of the wing is what... Uh, oh, uh, Fisher is playing a gentleman named Dale, or Dale Ruth. Yeah, so Ruth saw that. So that, that, that's why he went to there. And now Fisher knight c5. Notice how not only is he kind of possessing the center with a couple of pieces and pawns, but his influence is really gaining traction into White's area. I, yeah, I know that's a generality, but it's generalities that we beginners and intermediates need to constantly keep in mind. I mean, there's thousands of things to keep in mind, and yes, I'm simplifying it greatly compared to what could be said, but I've only got a few minutes to make a video, right? Alrighty. Hey, we're having fun. Well, of course, Queen will take the B pawn. What he doesn't uh, want is for Fisher to goof up his queenside pawn structure. That was, it's worth bringing out your queen and then bopping her back and stopping that pawn from marching in here and then creating weaknesses on the queen side. That's what Ruth got rid of by that queen move. So it's not a waste of time to make a couple of queen moves in this instance. What he's doing is he's trying to have a long-term vision into the end game, right? If you can keep your pawn structure intact, something I really need to practice, and I've mentioned it to several of you while I'm playing, I'm going, wow, you know, I've got to learn how to play better with my pawns. I get my pawns wiped out. I'm constantly trying to catch up in an end game Several of you have had five pawns, and I've only had two. <laughs> that makes endgame tough, you know, and that's why I'm losing. So this is important to see that, that they are taking care of their pawn structure. Center thrust, d5. Bobby's going to argue for the center. E takes d5, and now he pushes to the knight. Again, he's, he swapped one knight. Uh, the queen isn't necessarily in the center. Yeah, she cuts through a little bit, but uh, the knights, Bobby is getting rid of the knights so that the center for white is not nearly as strong. And that explains why he's doing so many pawn pushes, right? Now, now this is a young Bobby Fisher, however, I'm just saying. Knight to d2, he bumps back. What this does, according to Muller, uh, in the uh, tournament book record of Bobby Fischer's games, he said this knight move, what Bobby did is cramped uh, Ruth. He cramped his opponent. That knight kind of gets in the way of the bishop. It blocks off a, 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 a column, a file for the rook. So Bobby is improving his position. He's gaining space while he is causing problems with his opponent's position. General, I know, but, but very important to grasp, yeah? And then knight to d3. Now that's an outpost. Look at the fork on the queen and the rook. That is beautiful. Very well done. And the bishop. That is well done. That's quite poignant. That, that is good. Well, queen will take e4. A nice actual central response to uh, Fisher here. He lost the rook. So Fisher is up the exchange here, but look at this. Ruth pushes the pawn. Unfortunately, uh, at this point, that pawn push doesn't have the sting. The uh, Oh, if he could have had a rook there, that would have been brutally fabulous, right? But it doesn't quite have the sting that he was hoping it would. However, now the queen can take a8. The knights are gone. It's not a trap. So he got his rook back. So through the process of calculating, they're staying pretty even in this game. No one's really blowing anyone else off the board. Uh, and this is really interesting how he, how Fisher does this. He threatens the queen, and the queen takes f8. So 
He's trying to get as many smaller pieces as he can for compensation for losing his queen. And he doesn't quite get there. <laughs> he, he made a great effort at it, though, didn't he? So king takes, and now king f1. Of course, he's going to try to take the knight, but the knight is going to take the pawn, hitting the rook. Of course, the rook's not going to stay there. It comes to here, and the knight is not going to stay there. It comes out here right in the center. So you see the battle for the center is an ongoing uh, issue throughout the game. Bishop to d3, hitting a target, making sure he's in the center as well. Bishop to b4, a wonderful uh, move for hitting the target here and it is at this point that actually White resigned because he realized, yes, he is up a piece. Uh, but let's look at this, and I, I've worked out uh, a possible continuation. There's hundreds of them, yes. One I came up with to show why White probably did properly resign. For one thing, uh, White doesn't have a lot of targets that he can hit, right? He doesn't have a lot of coordination with his pieces to mount any kind of an attack, either in an area of the board to create weaknesses or against the king. The king is just fine. There's no problem with the king. His rook is completely out of play. His rook is horrible. His bishop is a, a hard bishop. Yes, he has the bishop pair, but his dark square bishop's back here. So let me show you a possible continuation that shows why White properly did resign. And then bishop e4, he centralizes on an outpost, which is nice, but the bishops will just exchange. Bobby has the queen, so he can afford to exchange. And that is where the problem is, is he had the queen, and yet he can exchange, and he does, and now knight takes f3. And king comes to e2, and knight to d4 check, and then king comes to e3, and then knight to c2 check, and king comes to f4, and now the knight takes the, well, the knight takes the bishop. Where, where, come on, where did I go wrong? Oh no, king f4. Bishop d6. Yeah, sorry. Bishop d6. Get it right, you clown. And then the knight takes the bishop. And the queen takes the knight. Check. The king goes down one. The queen comes up one. The king goes down one. The queen comes up one. Or no, it doesn't. No, she doesn't. She goes to here. And so he loses a rook. So... The, the position was such for White with, unfortunately, with his rook and bishop on the back rank and Fisher being able to afford to swap another piece or two, White couldn't do it. So that was a really nice little Sicilian defense by Bobby Fisher. Hang on and I'll show you another game in this particular video. I'll do two games on this video of uh, another Bobby Fisher game that I thought was really cool. All right, here's this next game. Is that recording? Yeah, that's recording. Sun's right in my eyes. Not in your eyes. That's what counts. Here's the next game Fisher played against a, a guy named Smith. Uh, so they're on the Sicilian defense again. Uh, Fisher really did play a, a wicked Sicilian defense. Throughout his career, we will get to see how he played the Sicilian as black, and he had to play against it as white because he was a king pawn opening sort of dude. <laughs> and no, he was not a dirty rat. He was the Bobby Fisher. Yeah, baby. Okay, so C takes, typical. Knight takes, typical. No surprise here. Knight f6, typical. So we're getting a good opening. Knight c3 this time. Smith opens differently than what Fisher played the last game at this point. He bumps this pawn to keep out any, any knights to goof up his queen side. Bishop comes to g5. 
E6. Bobby is cautiously expanding. The thing to remember with pawns is once you push it, it can't go back. And with every pawn push, you leave weak squares behind. Right? And those become targets for your opponent. So Bobby is being cautious with his pawns in this game. He is advancing his center just gently, not majestically and powerfully, and oh, with a sword stab, more or less just kind of a percolating center moving. So being cautious, queen d2, h6, he says, okay, let's make up our mind with the bishop, and the bishop comes back to e3. Knight g4, let's see what happens here. He brings his other bishop up, getting ready to be able to castle, which is always a good thing, especially against Fisher. And now, knight will take that bishop. Knight takes the e3. You can see that's why Bobby made the extra knight move. He's going to get rid of the bishop pair of his opponent. So, he retakes with the queen instead of the pawn. If you retake with the pawn... True, when you castle, you have an open file for the rook, but it, if, if at all possible, if you can, you want to keep the three pawns on your castled king side as long as possible. It's better cover than just two pawns, so that's probably why he retook with the queen. It makes sense why he retook with the queen. Bobby develops more, and now he thrusts f4. This is the other reason, because instead of exchanging with the pawn, by taking it with the queen, now white pushing the f4 can improve his center. So that's kind of a cool little thing to see, right? How do I exchange a piece when something like that happens? That's one reason why you do not exchange with this pawn, because it makes a stronger center. Even though it is the f pawn, yeah, and the current wisdom today is don't push that f pawn if you can help it. So anyway... This was back in 1956. Let's see how White did, right? Of course, then the problem with White is he is playing Fisher. Now, notice he keeps pushing the F pawn. He is already trying to break up the central pawns uh, of Bobby Fisher. Notice, at this point, he didn't push his pawn. He didn't retake the pawn. He ignores and he castles anyway. That's kind of a cool little mini lesson for us to say, look, castle. Castle early when you can, right? Just say it. Bishop g4, he's going to support the pawn now. Now Bobby has to, rather than uh, taking it on, uh, I think the reason Bobby does not want to push this pawn and close the center off is because he's got the bishop pair, so he wants to keep the center open because bishops like open boards better, right? So doing that gives him a very bad dark squared bishop. That's just my suspicion. Uh, Muller didn't say anything. We don't have any notes on what Bobby was thinking at this point. But that's why I personally suspect he just ignored this tension and let it sit there for now. Bobby does something much more important. He brings out another piece. Knight c6. You notice he's still bringing out his pieces. Yeah, that's what you want to do. And granted, you say, well, all he did is he got the knight taken. Yes, but it exchanged one of the opponent's knights as well. It gives Bobby a B-file opening, and it connects his pawns. He doesn't have any isolated pawns. So it's all good at this point. Notice they're keeping the tension over here with the F and E at this point. His opponent also castled, and notice Bobby still ignores the tension, and he puts the bishop to G5, hitting the queen. Target. Yeah. Right? So there are not a lot of open files just yet. One of our three pillars, but they are contending for the center. And they're contending for position. Queen drops to f2. Now he grabs the file. Rook b8. And his opponent will not let him have it for free. I, I should say the partial file. It's not an open file completely. Now, Fisher is going to try to clarify the issue in the center with the pawns. And this is how he's going to do it. He went to d5. Rather than taking the d, his opponent took the e pawn. f takes e6. Kind of interesting. Rather than 
taking it with the pawn, Fisher felt comfortable taking it with the bishop, which saves a tempo because he's developed and now his rooks are connected and his bishops are out and his bishops are very powerful. He, he exchanged one of the bishops of his opponent so that he could have the bishop pair. So it makes sense then that rather than taking it with a pawn and leaving his bishop pair unused, it makes good sense that he retook with the bishop. It's kind of nice when you see what is happening, who is exchanging which pieces in their position to see how they respond by improving their position and using the advantage. See, that's one of the differences. He's got the bishop pair, he doesn't, so use that bishop pair. That bishop move makes great sense, you guys. I'm thinking, right? So bishop bumps back down to f3, and now look, queen e5, powerful centralization, and now look, queen c5. So here comes the power in the correct part of the board at this point. Bishop f4, he's got a solid connection, he's got a great target here, g3. Notice he is inducing his opponent to push those king cover pawns, which will create weak squares around the king. Yeah? That's, that's just, um, just something to notice. Now, what is real interesting is, instead of moving his bishop again out of the way, Bobby ignores the threat. Something, if we can, we ought to do. You can't ignore every threat. Sometimes you must respond, but look over the board, check your position, see what other possible targets you might have, and see if it's worth acquiring those targets instead of always passively responding to your opponent. That's what we see Fisher do here. Very nice. A central pawn push. Hit the knight. And you say, well, just a minute ago you were lecturing us on Bobby having the bishop pair, and now he's willing to give it up? Well, let's see. Let's see what happens here. That's what's so fun. You notice the queen's swap. This is instructive, you guys. But he keeps the bishop pair. Right? To Bobby's mind... And we will see this in later... I mean, he's legendary for having the most powerful bishops of any grandmaster. Here we begin to see, early, early, early on, his love for the bishop pair. Now let's see if he can cash in on it, though. Let's see what the effect is, right? So knight a4, bishop takes a2. Target? Right? Nice. Rook B to E1. Okay, now putting the rooks together. And now using the file, target. Nice, right? <laughs> A pretty good coordination with rooks and bishops at this point, right? He's throwing his opponent off kilter. There's no question Bobby's opponent is responding to him at this point, right? I mean, how can he not? So knight comes to c5, he does acquire a decent c5 square at the point. Rook takes b2, target on a file using the rooks in conjunction with the bishop. Wonderful to see this. Really nice. Knight to d3, keeping... Now he's got good targets too, but they're covered. The rook isn't, but the... Oh no, the bishop isn't either. So he's got a good uh, fork keeping his central. He's going to try to keep compact because Bobby has the long range pieces out. The diagonals of the bishops and the up and the, the files and rows up and down. Yeah, the up and down of the rooks. So this could get a little bit tricky. We shall see. Bobby comes back to rook b5. Rook now to a1. White is acquiring targets of his own. Bobby's covering his bishop from the exchange. Notice how, uh, and no sooner than I say this than he's going to refute me, I bet. 
<laughs> he can even refute me after he's long gone. The power of the bishop pair with the rooks means that white has to have all of the pieces he can muster. So moving the rook down, white doesn't want to exchange. Isn't that interesting? He didn't get rid of Bobby's bishop pair. Now, I don't know if that was an oversight or if it was just his thinking that I have to keep every piece for defense that I can and yet try like crazy to get some offense going. Because once the bishop moves, he still has another target, right? So that's not a bad rook move. It makes sense why he put the rook there, sure, right? And, of course, the bishop will move. Bobby wants the bishop pair. And then he acquires a target. So, I mean, that was, that was a good move. That was a decent move. Because white's queenside uh, pawns have been taken. You better not leave black with a bunch of kingside or queenside pawns in an endgame. See, that's one of my defects in my game. I have to learn how to control and uh, get better at. I played several of you online where you just wipe me out in the end game because I've let my pawns get taken, but I haven't kept up with them. So this is a great lesson for me. That's the one reason why I like this game. There's just so much in each game that you can learn from, right? It's just mind-boggling. Rook to c8, yeah, protect the other pawn. Absolutely. Ah, bishop e2. Okay, now he's setting up so that so that if he, if he comes to here even, he has an, a, a discovered attack on the rook. So there's a, a possible little tactic here. You wanna, you wanna keep things like that in mind as much as possible. Bobby doesn't worry about that. He goes to g6, rook comes to e1, and bishop, where are you? Oh, Bobby's bishop, to h3. Now, the interesting thing is, he points out, Muller points out, that g5 would have prevented knight to f4. And that was probably a more important move than this bishop to h3. We'll see, right? We will see. And now, white rook to d1. And Bobby, Bobby, where are you? Bobby comes to e6. See, that, <laughs> that didn't accomplish a lot, did it? <laughs> kind of fun to see that, isn't it? And now the knight to f4, and now the, now the problem is Bobby starts acquiring targets, right? The knight left the square, the control square that he had control of, to try to come over here. And so now Bobby can take this aisle, right? So here we go. He will finally swap the bishop pair, right? So we're whittling down somewhat. And D, where are you? Bishop to D3. He's going to try to keep control of this pass pawn. He has no, uh, no pawns in front of him, so it's a pass pawn. Best way to do that, as Nimzovic said, is blockade that pass pawn. So that's what he's doing. Here comes Bobby's king. Rook A7 check. Interesting, Bobby swaps down. Rook C7. Rook takes c7, bishop takes c7. Bobby's willing to swap down because, and this this will make sense in a minute why he swapped down. Uh, bishop takes c7, rook to a1. He's going to try to come around here and king to e7. Bobby's going to centralize and keep his king in play, rook a4 target. That's a central pawn. But Bobby's got support. Not only does he is he able to support his pawn, he's able to stop the center pawn of the white. So this is a pretty good position at this point for both of these guys. Neither one of them have a lot of weaknesses that they can each exploit, right? King to d6. Bobby is more centralized, but white can become more centralized, of course. Rook a5. Did I do this right? Yes, I did. Bobby swaps the rooks. And now, um, at this point, yeah, at this point, they drew in a few more moves. They kept playing for a few more moves and moving around. But when you have a position like that, they ended up drawing. So 
So there's kind of a nifty little game, even though it ended in a draw, we can see, one, how the Sicilian defense is worked with black, if you're playing black and you want to see how Bobby Fischer did the Sicilian defense. Anyway, that is the, that's two games for this video. That'll work, right? Doesn't make the video too long or too short, so we'll call it good at that. I've got uh, some more Bobby Fischer games to show you. Thanks for watching my Backyard Professor Chess videos. Ah, it's good to be out in the backyard. The backyard is Mother Nature, so. I will see you guys in the next video. Be good, do well, have fun, drink lots of water, and stay sharp.